Today on NBC5 In Depth, as you send your kids back to school, what are they doing when they're not in the classroom or at home? Having that face to face and having that social interaction allows kids to develop better coping skills, communication skills, um, develop that sense of self awareness, um, confidence. We'll explore how social media and the pandemic have contributed to a lack of third places for kids. I think most people just resort to talking to each other on social media and just leaving it at that. How you can make sure your child is getting the socialization that's vital to their development. All that and more coming up on NBC5 In Depth. Good morning and thank you for joining us on this Sunday edition of NBC5 In Depth. I'm Lauren Granada. A new school year has already begun for kids in Vermont while students in New York prepare to go back to school this week. And as they focus on academics, what do they do, what they do outside of the classroom could be just as important. In sociology, the third place refers to the social surroundings that are separate from the two usual social environments of home and school. A study published in Science Direct cites that the pandemic and social media have changed third places in recent years. We spoke with the Director of Specialty Services at the Champlain Valley Physicians Hospital. She oversees the Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, uh, Psychi Psychiatry and Patient Unit. And as you'll hear her discuss, she's noticed a change in third spaces and how they affect young people in our region. We're joined by Bethany Susis then this Sunday morning. Thank you so much for being with us, Bethany. Thank you for having me. So when we talk about third spaces, how do you think that they've changed for our youth within these last few years? I believe that it is, they've changed in a sense that it's, kids don't have necessarily a place where they can socialize appropriately, um, whether it's with appropriate supervision. So, you know, I think about areas of where kids can socialize and it's more of after school programming, maybe sports or um, whether or not they're involved in after school activities. And some kids don't always have that opportunity. Um, and so it really affects kids socially as to where they can go um, to gain that one-to-one -one interaction or face-to-face -face interaction. And talk about the importance of a third space in a child's socialization. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, looking at what I've seen over the past year, having that face-to-face -face and having that social interaction allows kids to develop better coping skills, communication skills, um, develop that sense of self-awareness, um, confidence, which is a real huge thing uh, for kids and youth of today. Um, and unfortunately, when they're not getting that, they're relying on social media. Uh, you know, is, is where they're going and hanging out and, and attempting to get that. And social media doesn't provide, provide that in a way as one-to-one -one interaction does. What have you noticed as a result of that lack of socialization and more time spent on social media? What we're seeing is um, kids, you know, coming into the hospital, um, having increase visits to the ER in crisis, increased anxiety, increased depression, um, increase, um, again, lack of self-esteem, lack of confidence, um, which is, you know, providing a lot of, or causing, I should say, a lot of kids to have that negative thinking all of the time. Um, some, of course, we need to hospitalize to keep them safe, um, you know, really just self-doubt uh, that they belong here in the world. And again, we hospitalize them and some do get discharged home, but we do see an increase of um, ER visits and hospitalizations. And do you think it's the content on social media that is having this negative impact or is it also the effect of staring at a screen all day and not having face-to-face -face conversations? I definitely think it's both, um, but I feel that what kids are exposed to on social media nowadays 
um, really is unhealthy. Um, there is a lot more unhealthy stuff that kids tend to gear towards versus, you know, the, the more positive stuff, unfortunately. And kids who have the availability to socialize outside uh, versus in third spaces are kids technically that don't, I guess if I could explain it correctly, um, you know, I think about schools where, again, not all kids get to have the after school opportunities. So they tend to gear towards places that are not maybe appropriate. And same thing with social media, they're vulnerable. So they tend to uh, become more of a vulnerable to the internet predators that are out there as kids are searching for that feeling of belongingness. And we all know that it's about to get colder here in our region, um, which can make third spaces a little bit more difficult, especially for young people. Um, where are some places that you could recommend, some safe places that could promote that socialization for our youth? So I think about, you know, um, I know here in Plattsburgh, there's activities, I believe, through the YMCA. Um, I believe there are a lot of churches now that people that attend church will, will have church activities. Um, some of the communities will have different activities that go on that kids can participate in. Uh, volunteerism, I, I think, is important. You know, there's a lot of volunteerism opportunities um, in the area, whether it's the pet shelters, whether it's the hospital itself. Um, there's those opportunities as is some of the things that I think about. And do you think that financial disparities amongst families plays a part in to who can be more vulnerable to maybe a more negative experience with third spaces um, and that could lead to more of more challenges with mental health? It can, it, yeah, it absolutely can. It can play a part in that. And I think it's, you know, um, even though it may be looking at the financial piece of it, it's exploring those resources that are out there for families to be able to access third spaces that um, could give kids opportunities. What's your best advice to kids starting a school year, um, a fresh school year now, and um, when the importance of getting involved with their school and creating those bonds in order to have a third space to go to with them? My advice to kids is to you know, uh, reach out, you know, t talk to folks that are there to support you, um, you know, advocate for yourself. Um, you know, it's it's hard. It, it's, it's very difficult. It can be somewhat anxiety provoking sometimes, but take it day by day. And again, there's support within the schools that will help you. And we've talked a lot about the anxiety that can come with socialization as a result of a lack of a third space. But how do you recommend kids cope with that anxiety? Sure, um, again, it's knowing who you can count on, you know, create that support system that you, that kids feel comfortable with, you know, whether it's parents or, um, you know, counselors, uh, you know, speaking up and, and saying it's, coming forward and, and being okay with saying, I don't, you know, I'm not feeling right and being honest um, and being okay with reaching out for help. And do you think that this time of year back to school and the winter months, do you think that this is a more difficult time for kids in our region, especially when it comes to third spaces and socializing? Yeah, I do. Winters are, can be a little harsh up here at times. The cold weather tends to push people to stay inside versus be outside. Uh, so again, it just sort of draws the youth to social media. And so I, yeah, I do believe that weather does play a part in it. And if you were a parent looking for advice or looking for a way to guide their own children who 
maybe need a little bit more of a push to make new friends and to spend more time um, socializing. What's your advice to parents? You know, stay connected to your to your children. Um, you know, communicate with them. Take some time every day to check in with them, see how they're doing. Um, you know, look at community resources out there of what's going on um, and get involved. Uh, and we've also seen a lot of schools take up new cell phone policies where kids have to put their phones away mm -hmm. in class. How do you think this can positively impact not only learning, but also that socialization aspect? Yeah, I think, you know, I, it's going to be a bit of a trial and error at this point. I think kids today depend so much on their cell phones. Um, and, but I also think schools are definitely moving in a better direction with that. It's going to allow kids to be able to really focus on the present and um, in reality of what's in front of them versus what's on their cell phone. And as we look ahead to the future, it obviously doesn't seem like technology is going anywhere. Do you think that there's a way to be able to bridge that gap where kids can, can find positive and impactful social experiences online eventually? I think so. Um, you know, that's my hope. I'm optimistic uh, for sure. And, uh, and I hope that, you know, again, as adults and folks around that we're supporting kids to do that versus leaving them on their own just to find out, you know, where to go and where not to go. And talk to me just about the progression that you've seen over time um, since your experience in the professional world with children and where you kind of see it going with technology and uh, with today's challenges of social media. Yeah, um, I, you know, I'll tell you, I get nervous a lot at times, uh, you know, kids that come into the hospital, some of the experiences that they've um, encountered through social media or again through you know again with lack of confidence and lack of feeling of belonging and again they're just looking to have that being included and with a group of folks and that will accept them and it's and i get i you know i'm i honestly i hope that, you know, with kids coming in and we're teaching them uh, healthy ways to gain those social skills and coping skills to manage what's going on in their life, that they're out, you know, helping others, you know, spreading the word of what they've learned. But yeah, I mean, we really as adults have to take this serious. Bethany, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Still ahead, we spoke with some local high school students about third places. After the break, we talk about the barriers kids face when it comes to finding spaces to socialize outside of home and school. Welcome back. As we continue discussions on third places changing for kids around our region, we spoke with some Burlington High School students who just finished their first week of the new school year. One student says financial disparities can play a part in accessing third places. But as she explains, getting involved with school clubs and extracurricular activities can be a stepping stone to finding ways to socialize. You can make more friends by doing so. You can really get out of the house more. Um, and you can just say, hey, I got involved in such and such. And it's, you can do something. And like, it's really, like there's a lot of opportunities that can tie to your interests too. So no matter if it's art, music, or just anything, like if you like games, there's a club for that too. And just getting involved gets you out of the house. It, that's 
opportunities for you to meet people. <laughs> Why do you think it's important for you to be able to hang out with your friends outside of the house? Um, it's just important to keep like that um, relationship with your friends. Just, um, just so you know, like you're not just hanging out with them just during school, and it's just a strictly during school thing. Getting out of the house and hanging out with them could just really be. It could take stress off from school as well. Um, you could have a long day at school, and it's been a really rough day, and you can just go out and hang out with friends, and that just washes away. So friends really help take away that stress, especially when hanging out outside of school. And where do you like to spend time with your friends when you're not at home and you're not at school? Um, we usually like to go to the park. Uh, there's a park right where all of my friends live, so we usually go to the park, we hang out. Um, I know this summer we did plan a picnic, and we had a picnic, and it was pretty fun. Uh, we all brought different uh, like foods and like snacks for each other and drinks, and so just hang, we hang out by the park. Sometimes we'll um, go downtown and look at like the shops sometimes, but mainly those two places, the park or downtown. And we both know it's going to get colder soon. Do you think it's harder to coordinate time with your friends when it, it's cold out in the wintertime? Um, I definitely think so because I'm not really a fan of the cold. I moved here from South Carolina, so like it's a definitely it's a big shift in temperature wise when winter comes around. So yeah, I would say it's a lot harder to be able to do things during winter because a lot of people want to be inside and that kind of costs money. So like going to the movies or doing escape rooms, that costs money and it's kind of a huge barrier to be able to hang out with friends. So I think most people just resort to talking to each other on social media and just leaving it at that or sometimes just hanging out during school. And it, for me, it does like create a huge barrier on being able to talk to, not talk, um, hang out with my friends outside of school. How do you think that affects your social health? Um, it affects it a lot because usually if I'm not out, if I don't have plans with friends, I'm usually just on the couch just watching TV or on my cell phone. And even though I do have chores at home that get me off the couch, just once I finish those, if I don't have plans, I'm literally just sitting there. And that's something I do want to work on. I want to be able to go outside more and spend more time with my friends. We also spoke with the Burlington School District's superintendent, Tom Flanagan, about the subject. Here's what he had to say about it. Um, in other places and here, I understand the importance of third spaces. I know that as for me, it's important that uh, because it shows the way that the community kind of wraps around our young people to provide support for them both in school, outside of school, before school, after school, in the summer. And it's something that we've been able to commit to as a district because we had some funding, some federal funding for COVID relief. Um, and now we've been able to carry that forward. So we're, we're still providing after school programming for our students K through pre-K through 12 and we're really excited about the opportunity to be able to do that. We also work with our community partners to make sure that we're coordinated in, in the third spaces that exist. So we want more third spaces, more access uh, to third spaces, and we've increased our ability to provide third spaces for students. And so, yeah, it's very, very important because we have students for a limited time during the day, during the week, but we know that students need, need structure and support more at kind of outside of the school hours. And so if they're not playing a sport, you know, or doing some other extracurricular, having those third spaces uh, really supports their well-being and, and uh, keeps them engaged. And so we really want to uh, keep doing what we're doing and expand, even be able to expand. And earlier, during our conversation with Bethany at CVPH, we spoke about cell phone policies changing in schools across our region. Several have implemented new regulations on smartphones and other smart devices. This month, the Lake Placid Central School District amended its student code of conduct. It requires all middle and high school students to silence all cell phones, smartwatches, personal computers, tablets, and even smart glasses, then store them in their lockers during school hours. The new policy also allows schools to search backpacks if they suspect a code of conduct violation. 
Burlington High School is another one. Starting this school year, handheld devices can no longer be used in the classroom. If a student is caught using their phone, it'll be held at the main office until the end of the day. Burlington superintendent says this is meant to help students learn better without the added distraction. And another student we spoke with agrees that phones can hinder their learning. But really trying to protect that instructional time so students can really be engaged in their learning and connected with their peers and their teachers to optimize their learning. Well, I think it might be a challenge getting used to, but it's been something that the school has been trying to do this kind of the whole time we've been here. It just hasn't really worked, but maybe this year it'll finally work. This same cell phone procedure was implemented in Burlington's middle schools last year. And if you think the middle school age is too young for kids to have phones, Lamoille South Supervisory Union just banned phones in its schools, including elementary school. NBC5's Anna Guber spoke with one family before the start of the school year about this new policy. Uh, it's a big distraction in class. A lot of the time I can see kids like sneaking onto their phones or even though very few kids do have phones. Gabriel attorney is a student at Stowe Elementary. While most of his classmates don't have phones yet, he says for the ones who do, he already sees them becoming a big distraction in school. Or watches. I see them sneaking on watches. They're bored and playing little games or on their phone and yeah, like watching or texting people. And that's just one reason the incoming fifth grader stood in front of the Stowe School Board advocating for a cell phone ban during school hours. I think it's good that they're stopping that. But it wasn't just Gabriel calling for change. Superintendent of the Lamoille South Supervisory Union, Brian Herity, says most families in the district have also been in support of a phone-free school day. We did a survey and reached out to all of our families and said, would you be supportive of this new policy? Over 80% of our families said they were highly supportive of it, and the survey results indicated they wanted us to do it sooner than later. Gabriel's mom, Adriana, says when talks about the policy change started, she had some concerns. I was very concerned. What would happen if there's a school shooting? What would happen if, um, you know, the, there's just the, the school got shut down? You know, as a mom, my initial thought would be, I want to connect and contact my child immediately. But she says her hesitation eased as she learned more about it. Like how students texting their parents could distract them from hearing critical information during an emergency. Because right now they're like really focused on, you know, I need to tell my mom, I need to keep her up to date. And, you know, that could get in the way of whatever instructions the teacher is trying to convey and communicate. Meanwhile, Herity says research also points to phone bans during school, also reducing bullying, improving students' mental health, and strengthening their sense of community and belonging in school. Our goal as a school system is really to empower our students to thrive every day. And so taking phones out of the classroom is something concrete that we can do for that. So we decided to do it. Anna Guber, NBC5 News. We'll be right back after this short break.